Okay, so this lecture will be kind of a crash course in biology, um, fundamentals of biology as they relate to marine biology. Um, probably not too new for you biology majors already, but, um, and even if you're not a biology major, I'm sure a lot of this will sound very familiar. So we're going to start by talking about um, the food we eat, specifically this cheeseburger. If I were to ask you what is this made of, um, you might list some ingredients. You might even list a few organisms such as wheat or sesame or, um, you know, might come from the milk of cows in which uh, bacteria might or yeast might have been used to make it. So, um, but you might even go even further back and break it down even smaller. So in biology, we r relate things on different levels or different levels of organization. And one of those includes, you know, the chemical level. So if you were to say, um, to look at what this is in terms of the macromolecules of life, you would break it down into um, our four different types. So generally the things we eat are made of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. There are nucleic acids in there as well, but uh, nucleic acids kind of break down into sugar and, and some of these other uh, macromolecules as well. And you can see these macromolecules listed on your nutritional label, right? So you got carbohydrates listed, um, sugars are carbs, uh, protein listed, and fat listed. You don't see nucleic acid is listed because again, those break down into sugars. So each of these are uh, made of repeating units called uh, monomers. And so the repeating unit of a carbohydrate um, is actually expressed as a ratio um, of one to one carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Um, however, when you get into those uh, also make what are called sugars um, or saccharides and a monosaccharide, an example of which is glucose or galactose or um, fructose. Those you can make in different arrangements or combine in different arrangements and different chains to make different types of larger molecules. So the monomer would be the sugars and the polymer or the, re the, the combined um, combination of those repeating units is called a polymer. Now most carbohydrates that um, are found in living systems are used for energy, but they are also a very important part of um, um, structural elements. So they can be used to identify cells within a body. They can also be used to create things like cell walls or in, uh, in plants or in terms of um, arthropods and crustaceans, they have a, a carbohydrate called chitin, which is found in the shells of uh, crabs, lobsters, and other arthropods. Um, and so those are made of long chains of glucose, which are packed together in a way to make them hard and structurally um, supportive of their other body parts. Proteins uh, act as kind of the functional parts of cells and throughout the body. So they are, the, the polymer of proteins would be called a polypeptide, and then the monomer would be known as amino acids. So those amino acids can be strung together to make, uh, and there are 20 different types of amino acids, um, and how you string them together makes different types of proteins. Now proteins can be used as enzymes, hormones, they can be used uh, structurally so they form the main components found in muscles. They can be used to um, form immunity um, in the immune system and can also be used to help transport substances through cells or through the blood. Um, and so they are they're found throughout organisms um, with varying functions, but oftentimes are kind of the active, they aren't structural, but they are an active part of um, chemical processes. 
Lipids, by definition, are hydrophobic, meaning they repel water, um, and are commonly known in organisms as fats and oils. Um, there are oils that act as waterproof in marine organisms or marine birds. Um, so an example of this is a duck. If you pour water over a duck's back, the water droplets do not stick to it and they, they um, fall into the water. It's because it has a layer of oil which it secretes from glands which um, covers the feathers and repels the water. Uh, fats are also great for energy storage, so you get more calories per gram of fat um, in when you burn fat for energy than you can for the other types, protein and carbohydrates. They are also uh, elements of structural components such as in the cell membrane or um, parts of the cell which need a layer around it, so they are the principal component of what's called phospholipids. The phospholipids are like what you see here. They have a, a phosphorus head and lipid tails, and those lipid tails um, create a simple barrier um, for the inside and the outside of the cell. They also can act as hormones, which act as signal, signaling molecules, um, such as testosterone and estrogen. Nucleic acids, then, uh, we mentioned these aren't really for uh, nutritional needs, but they are um, for um, storing genetic information and processing that genetic information to make proteins. All right, so DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid, are the two types of nucleic acids Excuse me. found in all cells of your body. Again, DNA provides the instructions. RNA helps to make the proteins. So you make RNA from DNA and then you use that RNA um, to put together amino acids to form specific types of proteins. There are three types of RNA that are important for that process. Messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. All right, so another question again when we're looking at our food. Where did this come from? Again, you might point to a farm or um, a, a supermarket where you might pick these things up. But if you want to go back further and further and further, what process led to these? All of these uh, different parts of the cheeseburger can be traced back to uh, certain cellular functions. Um, the first of which is, or most basic of which, is photosynthesis. Okay, and this is the process by which you take carbon dioxide out of the air, add water, use the energy from light to form carbohydrates, um, specifically glucose, and a byproduct of that is oxygen. So, um, organisms that can photosynthesize include algae. So you have here this guy lying in this giant um, mass of algae, which you made into a chair. Looks really comfy. Um, also cyanobacteria can photosynthesize. And plants, of course. Um, now there aren't as many plants in the ocean as there are algae and cyanobacteria. Uh, but there are some in which um, photosynthesis, of course, is fundamental to all three. And this forms the basis of our food chain. So, um, of course, plants rely on photosynthesis to make sugars and to make structural elements which help them grow, and then we harvest those plants and eat them. Um, animals eat those plants, which we also eat, and so we can trace everything back to this process of photosynthesis. All right, this is just a figure, again, showing the basics of photosynthesis. You have uh, energy um, exciting a molecule called chlorophyll, which combines carbon dioxide and water to create glucose or sugar. And then a byproduct of oxygen is emitted into the environment. All right, kind of the opposite of photosynthesis then, how we take, um, use energy which has been created by photosynthesis is called respiration. And cellular respiration then takes that glucose which has been 
um, captured through photosynthesis and then breaks it down into smaller and smaller molecules and as it breaks down in in a bunch of different steps it releases energy okay a longer process is called aerobic respiration um, and it has multiple steps in which a lot of energy can be made available from one molecule of glucose you also have anaerobic or fermentation anaerobic um, respiration and this does not require oxygen but also does not have as many steps and does not give off as much energy so it's not as efficient in the use of glucose but it is quicker and more simpler so a lot of smaller organisms such as bacteria will use anaerobic processes for energy as opposed to aerobic okay these um, two processes then, photosynthesis and respiration, um, take the same materials, glucose and oxygen, as either the starting or ending um, components and um, are either capturing energy or releasing energy for use. Now, only plants, algae, and cyanobacteria, or what are commonly known as autotrophs, can photosynthesize. Um, everything needs to respire or have cellular respiration. So um, animals that eat plants and animals that eat other animals um, participate in respiration, but so do the plants themselves. So they produce oxygen, but they also use that oxygen in, um, in processes of respiration. All right, so um, photosynthesis and respiration are examples of anabolic and catabolic processes. So in an anabolic process, you require energy to make a, a bigger molecule from smaller molecules. So this would an example of this is photosynthesis, where you take carbon dioxide molecules, you tie them together to form sugar molecules using energy from the sun. Uh, catabolic reactions then are the opposite, where you take these larger molecules like glucose, you break them into smaller um, carbon dioxide molecules and it releases energy in the process. You can do this um, with proteins, so you can break down proteins to use energy or you can tie proteins together to make or tie amino acids together to make um, our functional parts of the cell. Um, and lipids and nucleic acids also follow these same uh, anabolic or catabolic pathways. So um, in the making and capturing of energy you have um, different levels of energy capture and different levels of energy use. Okay, The very bottom part where you have photosynthesis partaking place um, this is called primary production and these are our autotrophs again they can go through photosynthesis and are at the bottom of our food chain um, animals that eat primary producers are called primary consumers okay so uh, we also call these herbivores so you have like this grasshopper eating this plant or these zooplankton which are very very small animals which can eat phytoplankton okay and then you have animals which eat those, which would be secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers which eat those, and so on and so forth. So you can go up and down these different, um, what are called trophic levels. Okay, and where an animal fits on these, you know, what it eats and what eats it, uh, depends on where it is on this um, trophic food chain. All right, so. We talked about the different organisms that we may have split these into. Um, one thing we do in biology is we try and classify organisms and put them in different types. So if you were to be, uh, to be given all these different um, species that we talked about, such as the cow, the lettuce, the wheat, um, the sesame seeds, um, I don't know why it would be there. Maybe there's some honey mustard on there. Um, um, you could group them according to different things. So you could say, oh, well, uh, let's group the cow and the um, sesame seed and the wheat and the bee and the 
lettuce together because they are all multicellular and we would put the yeast and the bacteria together because they are unicellular. Okay, that would be one way you can group them. Um, and we group things, you know, you can group things based on lots of different parameters, but uh, in biology we want to group things according to kind of how they're related to each other or their common ancestor. Now one basic way in which we can break things into groups uh, which has to do with relationships or common ancestors includes a prokaryotes and eukaryotes or prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms. So prokaryotic organisms lack a nucleus okay so in their cell they don't have a nucleus which holds the DNA but they do have a chromosome and they do have a ribosome and ribosomes are little parts which create proteins. They have a circular ring of DNA, they generally have a cell wall, and they are uni unicellular. So you can find these, and so generally prokaryotic organisms are bacteria. You can find bacteria, we use them to help make our cheese. They're also found in the guts of many animals which eat plants, and they help digest the plants in which they eat, so they live within our guts as well. You can, and so here's an example of a prokaryotic photosynthetic bacteria. It's one cell. It has here a cell membrane and a cell wall. It has this photosynthetic membrane, which it uses for photosynthesis. It contains chlorophyll. It has a gooey fluid-like substance called cytoplasm. It has ribosomes in which proteins are made. It has this one um, kind of circular form of DNA, and then it has different elements within there that kind of hold the cell up and give it structure, which is the cytoskeleton. Eukaryotic organisms are a little more complex. They have DNA enclosed inside a nucleus. They have what's called organelles or little specific um, different parts within the cell. And they can be unicellular or multicellular. So this manatee is a eukaryote, this grass is a eukaryote. Um, organisms living in the deep sea, such as tube worms on these hydrothermal vents, are also um, eukaryotes. And the eukaryotic structure is a little more complex. They have um, structures called the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, ribosomes can be embedded on there. So if it's, there's ribosomes on there, it's rough. If not, it's smooth. You have a Golgi apparatus, which helps um, sort and modify proteins and create these little vesicles. You have a plasma membrane just like prokaryotes. You have a mitochondria and this is where cellular respiration takes place and also a cytoplasm and cytoskeleton. So these are just the basics cellular parts of a eukaryotic cell. So we talked about all these already. Um, you can go through, pause it, and write these down if you need to. <coughs> All right, another way, again, we can classify these, or the science of classification, is called taxonomy. So classifying and, organ and, and, and organizing or grouping organisms is called tax taxonomy. So an example of this is all these butterflies are actually different species, even though they look very, very similar. Um, you can find subtle differences between them. They may live in different areas. Um, they may also live in the same areas but not be able to breed with each other. So there's different ways in which we can classify species of organism. One of the most common ways recently has been by looking at their DNA and the similarities within their DNA. You can also look at their proteins. What proteins do they produce? Um, you can look at their development. Um, so what structures they have at certain parts of their cell uh, life cycle. Um, you can look at the fossil record and find relationships between fossils and extant or living organisms. And the most basic way then, of course, is by looking at physical characteristics. So even by physical characteristics, you could probably tell um, specific differences between these different butterflies and be able to determine then um, which are different species. Now, the way we order them is by... Um, relation, like I said before, common ancestors, and we can do this at different levels. So we start with domain, then we go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. 
Um, and then the species is, we even have subspecies below that, but species is generally how we identify um, what organism or what kind of organism it is. But we can group those species then into specific genuses. We can group those genuses into families and so on and so forth up and down this um, levels of these levels of classifications. A species name is written in italics or underlined with the genus capitalized and the species lowercase. So some examples are Homo sapiens, which is humans, Balaena mysticetus, which is the bowhead whale, uh, Metacarcinus magister, which I can't remember what that is. But um, every species has a species name, and it needs to be, uh, this is something that could be quizzed on or test on, needs to be this two-part capitalized genus lowercase species. We'll talk more about that in class. So here's some examples again of all the different classification um, levels of humans down to homo sapiens. We are eukaryotes, animals. We have uh, a spine cord chordate uh, grouping there. We're mammals, primates, so on and so forth. Dolphins um, share a lot of the same things until you get down to the order. So they in the order Cetacea. And then this type of dolphin is a bottlenose dolphin, so it's Tersiops truncatus. So again, you notice the species name includes the genus and then another species name. And that allows you to say this and give you a better idea. If you just say truncatus, well, there's a lot of different species that may use that same uh, species, but they won't have the same genus. So one of the things when talking about species and, and classifying them into different types is, well, first you have to define what is a species. And so there are a couple different ways that we do this. One is called the biological species con concept, which basically is if two um, types of animals breed um, in the wild, then they are s not separate species. Um, this kind of breaks down though with some species like lions and tigers. So you can create a liger or a tie-in depending on whether a tiger is the mother is male or the mother is female. Oh, sorry, the mother is a tiger or the mother is a lion. Um, and so we, you know, and this only applies then to species that sexually reproduce. Or the phylogenetic species concept looks at similarities in genetics, and that can be done no matter um, um, whether a two different uh, animals that you're looking at are sexually reproducing or not, or whether they sexually reproduce, reproduce in the wild or not. One of the ways that we uh, display then these relationships is through what's called phylogenetics, where we're um, using graphical representations um, showing the common ancestors and how far um, in millions of years or maybe even in numbers of base pairs in their relationship. Uh, a phylogeny is also a hypothesis so it isn't necessarily concrete and they can change when you have more and new information. Um, they can be based on things that aren't genetics as well but uh, generally are strengthened when you use many different um, criteria to group them together. So an example here, we have two different phylogenies here. These are two different um, hypotheses for how these five echinoderms uh, species are related to each other. So another important part of biology are the levels of organization which range from the atomic level down to all the way up to the ecosystem level and we mentioned these in class a little bit. Um, everything in between then builds on top of itself um, until in the ecosystem we start talking about um, how species and groups of species interact with the, their physical environment. You should know those. Okay, and here's just a graphical representation showing those different levels. Okay. Let's see how much more we have here. All right. So, oops. 
All right, so fundamentals of marine life that have to do with biology include water and salt regulation, temperature regulation, reproduction, and evolution. So in order to understand biology um, as it applies to marine life, these are the basic things you have to know. So first off, we have to understand how molecules move within a solution um, because marine organisms all live within this highly concentrated salt water. So or, um, substances within a solution move through a process called diffusion. And this is where the solutes or the salts naturally move from greater concentration to lesser concentration. So if you drop a cube of salt within a um, fresh water, a uh, cup of fresh water, those salts will begin to spread apart until they are evenly spaced. Osmosis is the same thing, but it occurs through a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and this is where water flows through that membrane to create, again, uh, an even distribution of solutes. Now, why does this um, apply to uh, marine organisms? Well, marine organisms have to deal with these high concentrations of salt. And whether they um, are you know, if their internal body is less or greater concentration in salt than the water that they live in, they may have to regulate that through, you know, drinking more water, excreting salt, or uh, variations of that. Some things, however, just don't do anything with their salt regula regulation, and those are called osmoconformers. Um, so here's a hagfish. It doesn't regulate its salt uh, concentration. It just uh, balances its salt concentration with whatever it's in. Now, it generally lives in a specific type of part of the ocean in which that concentration remains constant. So if you tried to put this hagfish in a freshwater stream, it would um, be too concentrated and it wouldn't be able to survive. A similar thing happens um, when salmon switch from salt water to swimming upstream where they spawn. Um, so what happens is they temporarily can regulate the amount of salt which is uh, being lost to the water, but can only do it for enough time to where they can lay their eggs or lay their sperm and then they die. Okay, so they can os osmoregulate or change the concentration of salt and water within their body compared to their environment, but only temporarily and eventually they will die. All right, so temperature control is also very important for the marine environment because um, water tends to suck um, heat from organisms. So if you are an organism that requires an elevated body temperature, such as a mammal, you're going to have to have um, different um, strategies in order to do that. So we classify different organisms based on their temperature regulation mechanisms. Ectotherms generally um, don't or, or rely on the, the external environment to warm or cool their body. Poikilotherms um, mimic the temperature of the environment in which they are in. So fish generally do this. Endotherms have to have their internal body temperature regulated by metabolic processes within their body. So mammals, whales, we are endotherms. Homeotherms maintain a constant internal temperature, so they have to have a narrow range of temperatures. All right, so you can be a homeothermic endotherm like this whale. You have to maintain this constant internal um, body temperature and do it metabolically. You can be an ectothermic poikilotherm and different combinations of, of each. Sea stars, okay, they don't regulate their body temperature, so they are poikilotherms. Um, and they are at the um, mercy, I guess, of their environment. Um, and they can't really maintain a constant internal body temperature unless the, the water surrounding them is constant. All right, reproduction, um, 
we have different types of reproduction, including asexual reproduction, where you do not need a second individual in order to reproduce. Some of this occurs through fission, where you split one organism into two smaller um, organisms of equal size. You may also have budding, where one small piece of an organism breaks off from a larger piece and becomes its own separate organism. And vegetative rep reproduction, which occurs in plants, where different shoots or different sections of the plant can shoot off and become its own separate organism as well. Sexual reproduction occurs when you have the exchange of gametes where you have sperm and egg that come together to form a zygote. That zygote then goes through mitosis and becomes a new organism. Um, marine organisms have different ways in, in which they do this. One of them includes broadcast spawning where they just release sperm and egg directly into the water in hopes that they will somehow get together and recognize each other and form new um, organisms. So you see this giant clam here emitting its sperm or eggs, I'm not sure which one, into the water. Another organism will do the same and then they will get together. Internal fertilization occurs in some organisms where there is some sort of copulatory organ that delivers sperm inside the bottle cavity of uh, the female. And the advantages to each, broadcast spawning, you don't really have to worry about it, you just let it go and hope that you get some fertilized eggs and that's the end of your responsibility. Internal fertilization allows you to protect your zygote as it matures and give it some sort of um, protection while it's development, while, while it develops, but it requires more energy from the mother. All right, so finally, a basic part of biology is evolution and natural selection. So evolution is defined as a change in the genetic makeup of a population over time. So if a, a population is being subject to pressures of its environment, those in, environmental pressures will um, allow some species, some individuals within a population to live with certain traits while others uh, will die before reproducing. In order to have evolution, you have to have three things. You have to have variation in trait. If they're all the same, then evolution doesn't occur. You have to have selection, um, either by the environment or maybe sexual selection where you have males choosing for females. And you have to have some sort of inheritance, um, which occurs through the exchange of DNA in meiosis. So an example of this, you have these red um, fish and these blue fish, there's variation in the color. You have a shark and it prefers um, one over the other, let's say it prefers red fish. And so then these red fish and blue fish mate and now there are more blue fish genes in the population. Um, and so you have evolution occurring through natural selection via the shark. Now this can occur in smaller scales where you have a population changing over time. It can also occur over very, very long periods of time, which is what we would call macroevolution. And um, you can trace then the evolution of species over time um, using fossil record and genetics. And uh, generally make form theories about how different life arose with changes in environments. So here you have the um, early tetrapod, which has a structure in its forearm, which resembles what all tetrapods have, a radius and an ulna and some digits and carpal bones, okay? And you can trace this back to earlier um, species of fish, which had similar, but not the same structures in their flippers, and even further back in some pre other lobed fin fish. Um, and then this would then be another way in which you could study evolution or changes in the genetics of uh, populations over time. All right, that's it. I know that was a lot, but those are all the fundamentals of biology in a crash course.